McGray chats with White Horse, August 18th, 2021. How's it going? Hi. Hey, welcome to KMIC hey, Radio. <laughs> so, what, a pri- what a privilege. Yeah. All, all the way from, you guys are in Ontario, right? Yeah, we Toronto. Are. We're yes. in Toronto. To be exact. Not Ontario, California. No. Is that a place? Yeah. It's yeah. Like Los Angeles, right? Oh. Yeah. It's, out, it's, out, it's where they did California, or no, they did... Uh, I think they did California Jam out in Ontario because I went to it in like 1978. They had this big freaking monster uh, concert in the desert out there. It was so freaking hot, but hey, we were so all hot. Is that is that actually considered part of LA? I it's don't in know. LA County, but is LA it is, no, it's not in no, but but it's a giant. That's a giant county. Yeah, that yeah, I, I think it is. So you guys, I, I'm glad. Thank you for being here. Um, My pleasure. It's it's just. I've, I've loved you guys for years and you know that um, been following your career and uh, it's, I got to, got to talk to your son earlier tonight, which was, <laughs> so, thank you for that. That was such a good, <laughs> he's such a little gentleman, man. I love him, man. He was so starstruck. He's so into superheroes and oh. know, that's just his life right now. I got it. He just turned seven. Oh so. man. I got it. I'll send, I'll, I'll send you guys a big pile of comic books for him. I'll send you oh, a bunch that's of stuff. Sweet. Yeah. He'll Give be me, good. That'll be great. So anyways, let's get into this. Mm-hmm. You guys had solo careers. You you were doing fantastic solo work. And I know you're, you were working together on solo records too. But then mm-hmm. you decide to do this thing, this white horse. Uh, first off, do you take the name from the city? Because there is a city called White Horse in Canada, right? Yes, and I see someone has Welcome to White Horse. <laughs> yeah, Gary, ha- Yukon. Gary, Gary has Gary Amaro. <laughs> yep. You know, Gary we, we actually... Song. Um, th- I love the question and, and we named ourselves white horse so that people would ask us this question <laughs> truly actually. And the answer is yes. We named ourselves after the city of white horse in the Yukon, um, for one couple of reasons, but one in particular, because when we were, when we first started the band, we realized that we were going to get welcomed with open arms, which is wonderful because it's a nice place to be into the Americana community. And now <clears throat> that's a burgeoning definition i mean it didn't, that, that nobody would use that term 15 years ago no. it would have been like it would have been like blues or like alt country or folk or i don't know what now there's this big tent of which includes willie nelson and Lou harris and it includes like aging rock and rollers and it includes soft folk legends and it includes you know all kinds of stuff and we were like okay well this is the, this is the, this, this community is going to embrace us but we're from canada and we want to make sure that people know that so we figured, like, let's try and find a geographic location in Canada that we can name our band after. And, and initially, we thought we were going to be uh, Yellowknife, which is a city not far from Whitehorse. Well, I mean, it's far by, by reasonable standards, but in the great north of Canada, it's the next city. Um, although that sounded too punk rock, and we were like, we're a bit sissy for that. We can pull it up. <laughs> I don't great know. Name for, great name for someone, though. Great name for a punk band, yeah, but it wasn't, yeah. wasn't us. Yeah. So, so we la- like, last second, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. Like, we landed on Whitehorse, and it stayed... But yeah, you know, I think I think uh, the band started pretty organically because you know, as you were saying, we we had our solo careers, and and we're also we also happen to be married, and so you know, we'd be on tours and we'd be missing each other, and uh, you know, we met in the studio, and so we met in a professional sense, and had always kind of worked with each other, so. Um, it it wasn't a stretch. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Good. It wasn't a stretch to um, to play in each other's bands or to to you know sing on each other's records in the studio. Luke was producing my records, so uh, we were just very involved in each other's work right from the start, even though it was separate. Um, and then we did a tour together in in Europe, I believe, and it was just the two of us, and we just swapped songs on stage back and forth, and. At the end of each show, people were like, I want to buy the record. And we'd be like, well, we have this Melissa McClellan record. We have this Luke Doucette record. And and people didn't like that. They were like, no, no, no. I want the record. Like the record for the two of you. Yeah. And then so we, by the end of that tour, we were thinking, well, let's just do like a little side project. We'll just go into the studio, do an EP or a record and put it out under both of our names. And it'll be something that we can sell on tours like, like that. Um, anyway, so we went into the studio and it just like kind of 
turned into this really inspiring thing for us. And it, I think it took us by surprise how like all consuming and all encompassing it was. And it was just um, creatively speaking, it was really gratifying and, and satisfying. And I, you know, we got to a point where we're like, okay, we can't just like slap our names on this. We gotta like own this. Let's let's like come up with a band name. Let's do this. Let's put out a record. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. And we will call it Yellow Knife, and we will do punk rock. <laughs> oh wait, now forget it. It's not a good that's idea. That's an alternate life that's <laughs> veered off some alternate dimension. Now but I did. For that, just to, uh, not not to cut you off, just no. one more point about the name, just because I wanted to finish the thought. There is something about the, the north of Canada, about the tundra, about the, you get above the tree line, or not necessarily above the tree line at those points, but you get to parts of, of the landscape where it's really lunar in some ways, and it's really special, and it's unusual, and it's, oh. it's, it's hard to describe how beautiful it is, and how oh. remote, and the sky is massive. And I grew up in Manitoba, where had, which has a big sky, oh. and I feel like our music is kind of evocative of that big sky, so yeah. there's something actually about the landscape, mm. and, the, and the people who have gone as far away from megalopolis is as you can possibly go and lived people live a really cool lifestyle up there and we were just like you know there's something about this place and this lifestyle and this this landscape and this part of the world that somehow it resonates with the way we feel about our music so it wasn't just a random choice about a name it also had something to do with the way things are up there it, it really does fit it's a good name it has it does like you say it it has that it resonates with the sound I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, I it also does. realized that Dylan Thomas drank himself to death at the White Horse Saloon in New York City. So I don't know what it means, man. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know if that's yeah. bad. I'm not sure. <laughs> but but um, you, the the you, your sound does have a lot to do with your guitar too. Your guitar has that big guitar sound, you know. And I know you use the White Falcon. I have to bring up the White Falcon because we have I guitars. <laughs> We have guitar. Sorry, one sec. I just lost my audio. Ah! Yeah. These two um, are, are are sharing a two uh, earbuds, so it's it's a we're, mess. We're just not tech savvy. <laughs> like you'd think, after being professional musicians for three decades, we would get our shit together. But no, we don't. No, we don't have our shit together. At no, all. Luke, Luke, it's it's. Are we Zoom Zoom savvy? Nobody is. Zoom is just a weird new animal, man. I mean. No, thank you for giving me the out. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I play I play the Gretsch White Falcon, and I I was um so I, I've been playing with in Sarah McLaughlin's band for thirty years now, twenty eight years, um, and Melissa now plays in her band and has for over a decade, um, so that's a big part of what we do. But I was on tour with with Sarah some years back, I guess it would have been two thousand and three, <clears throat> something like that, and I was playing like I like old junky pawn shop guitars, like I don't you know I don't, I don't really like the fancy blues lawyer guitars. I like the ones that. <laughs> You know that you pawn choppy and weird, and you gotta, you gotta sort of massage them so that they do their job. But I was getting some flack from a guitar tech on the tour, and he was saying, "You know, your guitars are not staying in tune, and they're blaming me because it's my job to keep your guitars in tune, and I can't because these guitars are pieces of shit, and you need to get get a new guitar." So I was like, "Okay, I just want the big stupid white one that like Neil Young plays and Robert Smith from The Cure and Billy Duffy from The Cult." And I was like, you know, that big fucking stupid white thing, I want one of those. And three weeks later, a box showed up on the tour. And I opened it up and I pulled it out and there's a big white falcon. And I hit one big G chord on it and I just like, my brain exploded because it had such a huge sound. I couldn't believe the sound. It was, it, it, ironically, what that guitar enables a person to do is not play very much. Because you hit one big so note and it's like, <laughs> nobody move. Nobody move. This is exactly how things have to be. Hit one big string, which is such an American sound. It's such a, like a southern, a southwestern sound. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of that. That's a vibe. great story, though, because, you know, most guys, most guys you talk to and ask them, well, well now the guitar, because I went through 25 of the greatest guitars in the world and I found the White Falcon. But you were just kind of, it was kind of just fell in your lap. I mean, I knew, like, I yeah. knew, like, what I knew what Crazy Horse sounded like in the early days. Not Crazy Horse, I guess it was Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and yeah. early, you know, Neil Young days. I knew the sound, and I knew, I knew that like Gene Vincent and Dwayne Eddy rockabilly sounds. I'm a fan of that, and like, yeah. I, like I, it's, it all worked. Everything about it, like, this is great. Like, it's all, it was all cool for me. Yeah. So I mean, it, I, it wasn't a big. Uh, I was amazed at how powerful it was, 
but I wasn't entirely surprised that it was awesome because I I listened to a million records with that sound. Yeah. This is a great sound. I can't I, I can't lose. I can totally relate to the guitar tech though that had to put up with the cheap guitar <laughs> and had yeah. to try to make it work. Now, what's your favorite cheap guitar? What you the one that you have that you just Ooh. love? It's my favorite. Stella. Uh, so yeah, that's a really good answer. The, I have this Harmony Stella, uh, which is a plywood guitar. Um, I don't have it in the house, so I go grab it and show you. But um, they're usually they're, they're, they don't have a truss rod in the neck, so they can't the necks can't be adjusted. And this they're made in the '50s or the '60s, so most of them are garbage. They just hang them on the wall and they look nice, and it's a, it's a relic of a bygone era. But I happen to have one that for whatever reason I don't I don't know why, uh, it's great and it's really playable, and the strings are but this high off the neck and I've refretted it and it just sounds cool. And I always run it through an amplifier and turn it up. I don't, I don't try to make it sound like a real acoustic guitar. I try to make it sound like its own weird monster wow. and it does. And it's beautiful. That's, that's probably one of my favorites. And, and didn't you find it like just under a friend's couch and like it was abandoned or something? I don't kind know. of. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Jeff, Jeff, um, <laughs> my friend, Jeff, who I lived in Vancouver, BC for the night for the nineties. And, um, Jeff Avery was a friend of mine who would just like, it was one of those situations in Vancouver, like pass the guitar around, pass the joint around. Like you have to be kind of a, a hippie pothead in Vancouver or they just, they, they deport you from British Columbia. <laughs> and so we would hang out at Jeff's house in Kitsilano and, and that was the deal. Like joints, acoustic guitars, and we just sing, everybody sang songs all the time. And, um, and he eventually, he moved in the late 90s, just after my daughter Chloe was born, he moved to uh, New Zealand. And he said, Luke, can you take care of this guitar for me? I'll be back in like five years. And I was like, yeah, man, cool. I got it. Because it was such a special guitar. It just has a weird mojo. And like I say, the things are worth, at a pawn shop, they're worth 180 bucks. They're not worth anything because most of them are garbage. But this one's special. So yeah, that's the one. And he still lives in New Zealand 25 years later. So I went I went to New Zealand on tour on a Sarah McLaughlin tour, I don't know, 20 years ago. And, um, and I brought him a handmade, custom-built Larave, a Canadian-built, Guitar, a really nice guitar. And I said, wow. Jeff, I want you to have this because you're never getting your fucking harmony back. <laughs> that is so cool, man. And he was like, fair play, man. It's cheap guitar is really, I, I love it too. I, I just love it. You know, if, you're, if you can be, if you're a good enough guitarist and you can play the damn thing, even if it is going out, which, you know, you got to be able to play it. I guess it depends what you're going for. Like if you're trying to play slick and clean and perfect, you got to have a guitar that's intonated properly. And you know, there's certain kinds of music that you can't, you can't, you don't have that luxury. But I'm a big fan of Tom Waits, and I'm a big fan of Mark Rebo, yes. who plays. Mark plays with Tom Waits, and like, it, it, you know, there's nothing perfect about what he does, which is why it's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's so emotional and so evocative. And and you know, and I've seen him play, and sometimes he plays a guitar that has two strings, and he's got like silverware interwoven into the strings and it's like you know it's all good it's gonna be cool it just depends what you're now going. was there a day because i know melissa likes tom a lot too because i can hear it in her her solo records now was there a day where you guys both went yeah i, I was listening to this tom waits song and then melissa went no I, tom you like tom waits <laughs> well actually we uh I, yeah, we were definitely both Tom Waits fans separately. Um, but I think that when, when we bonded over Tom Waits, it was when Luke was doing, we were recording our first rec, my first record, Stranded in Suburbia. And he was invited to do a, 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 like a Tom Waits tribute night at some small bar in Toronto. And he chose the song Gun Street Girl. And, ah. and we were in the stu studio working full days and he asked me if I wanted to play that song with him and I was like yeah I love that song so Jeez. I started learning we both started learning the lyrics and oh my god there are like, like 3,000 <laughs> words in that song and like none of them make sense and it's just like the craziest imagery um but we we worked hard at it and then and then we we sang the song together um uh, that night and it was just like magical and you know what it really that night was really important to me because I feel like it really opened something up in my voice. Like up to that point, I was really just kind of playing with like pop, folk, indie rock kind of sounds. And as soon as I sang Gun Street Girl, which is really like kind of in the blues genre, um, it just opened up something in my voice that was so satisfying that I'd never tapped into before. And my following records really delved into 
more of those kind of rootsy styles and the more of the and like you said you you can hear some of the tom waits influence yeah. in my solo stuff and that definitely came from from that night oh man i feel yeah. like like there was it for a long time like you know if i'm in sound check and i'm feeling stupid like i'll try and get a guitar sound that people would never expect like i'll play like dire straits is money for nothing or i'll play like <laughs> So I'll play Sweet Child of Mine. I'll play like the <laughs> opening lick and people, everybody laughs. It's a big joke. So, you know, like just sort of ham it up with a sound that isn't sort of incongruous with what you normally do. And Melissa would sometimes sing country music or blues, but in a kind of joking, just kidding, ha 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 way. And I'd be like, you know, that's not actually a joke to me. Like when I hear you sing that way, it sounds really authentic and really special and really rare. Like it, it, it 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 was it was it made me think about Patsy Cline and Amy Lou Harris and all these wonderful like amazing country American country singers that I that I love and and there was I remember we would talk about it and you were always like really because it was kind of like you were joking and you weren't mm -hmm. sure and then we were like slowly we just like maybe we let's 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 take this a little bit seriously let's try to incorporate this s sincerely into the music we make and, yeah. and so not so much from a place of mockery yeah and it, but it took a long time you know to get comfortable and you know we've we've veered all over the place stylistically because we do genuinely love all these genres like like truly and you know we did uh as white horse we did a couple um blues eps called the northern south volume one and volume yeah. two um where you know we picked some of our our favorite standard blues songs or blues artists and um did kind of like a live off the floor thing in the studio with uh like when we started as a band we were using the looping pedal live which which kind of records a loop and then you add layers on top of it so it's very uh um you know you you kind of you kind of just go spur of the moment creatively and see what happens and it's different every time um so we wanted to bring that into the studio so we did that with with this blues material um and we actually have a a country record that we haven't released yet um so that was like a whole other genre that we tapped into. i can't i can't wait to hear that that sounds great you guys are quintessential i mean i agree with you luke americana is a fantastic genre now where they you know people they didn't like you said didn't use it before and now it is the now it is the the title yeah. for and it's so vast yeah and you guys are like quintessential you know you really do fit it well yeah you, i don't know i mean i i maybe and and we'll see i mean we we have um we put some distance between ourselves and the americana community in the last few years with some of the records that we've made like when we put out panther in the dollhouse mm -hmm. you know that was like it was sort of hearkening a little bit back to to the early, early mid '90s, like Beck and Portishead mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it did. Which, which wasn't as folky. It, it wasn't. Didn't have none of the country music was. There was no country, no pedal steels. All that stuff had been. We had sort of produced them in, in a different way, and and I think to, I think maybe we maybe at least a little bit alienated ourselves a tiny bit from the Americana world. You know, we were like, let's just take a chance and just see where yeah. this thing goes, and and so we did that. But um, we're definitely. Um, I think if you th if you think about if you look down the charts of Americana and you go okay, uh, how about this guy Amer uh, Aaron Lee Tasjan? He mm. does freaking he, he does like what you were saying does mm -hmm. '70s style groove, but sure. he's rooted like you guys rooted in something that's more you know uh, American and roots right. you know and so it's like once you've rooted yourself and you guys have then you can go off and still stay in the genre i think if you've built enough trust with your audience that yeah. they will follow you down the rabbit hole yep. and that's a real privilege. that's hard and it is a privilege and it's, it's hard. a privilege because people have to trust you because you throw this weird curveball and some people just abandon ship yep. but you know it's, it's just the, the hope is that people will trust you enough to follow you down the rabbit various rabbit holes that you go i and, trust uh, every note you guys play <laughs> well so I, I i make this i have this list in my head of artists that like i think about um, Lucinda Williams or Cheryl wow. Crow or, or Bob Dylan or Neil Young or Tom Petty or, or um, I don't know, artists that have made folk music, country music, rock and roll. They go blues. everywhere. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, they never, their sincerity never seems compromised. Yep. And, and again, it's a privilege to, be, to have the trust of an audience that you can take those chances. You know? But having said all that, yeah. this record we're putting out, in the new year and it, you know we have we're putting out three records this year we put one out three months ago one another one's coming out in september and and then this final record will be in in the new year and they're different they're all over the map 
But the final one is was very much inspired by the work that Brian Ahern and Emmy Lou Harris did in the 70s. Brian Ahern was her husband at the time and a yeah. producer. Uh, and he was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So there's a kinship there. I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah. I write songs for my wife. We produce records together. So there's kind of like this thing. But also we just... We just, I just, we just happen to love that era of those yeah. records. Those records yeah. are so fantastic. So they're, they're, um, it's, it's, it's country music, but it's 70s, 70s country yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like very man. simple. There's not a lot of production. Pedal steel, bass, guitar, drums. You sing a lot. That's you got it. me excited. I want to hear that. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> um, so you were, you were talking about your live performances earlier with the uh, loops and stuff. And I've loved watching you guys. Uh, it's like it's like musical chemistry. It's like Luke sits down at the drums and goes -ba 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 -ba. and then it's like looped there and then he jumps up and Melissa loops on something else and then you loop on this and then you play it <laughs> and it freaking all goes together and it just I, sometimes <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen you when it didn't work but I mean I think you use the, it at least when you were doing that as a duo like that. I think you use it better than almost anybody I've ever seen use it. Other people use it, and you go, "Oh, that's you could you could, if your eyes were closed, you'd go, that was there's a lot of loop there.'" But the way you guys put it together, it it just sounds like it's a band, man. You know the way we the way that it. If, I mean, thank you first of all because we were yeah we were like um, we we were really riding we were threading a needle in a weird way because we didn't I I know there's a way to do that where all of your mistakes get corrected. And it's a whatever, it's a quantized function on your software or the pedal you use, you turn a knob and it quantizes. And what it does is when you go loop, you know, if it's not, if, if you speed up you a little bit at time, all of a sudden there's a glitch. And yeah. now the, the, the function, the, the escape hatch or the, the social safety net of, of looping fixes those mistakes for you. It reads ah. what you've done and it corrects it. So wow. I watch people do that where I'm like, you didn't play that that perfectly and you just made it perfectly, but we didn't want to rely on that. We were like, let's just be hippies about this and let's like live and die well, by the sword. And, and not only that, but when we first started, Luke had a kick drum. Luke had a kick drum and I had a, a wooden box that I stomped on with my cowboy boots. So he was the <laughs> kick, I was the snare. And we had the loop pedal between us. So I would start the loop to record and he would hit the kick and then I would hit the snare and we'd do the full beat and then he, at the end of the beat he would push stop and then it would keep looping. So we really had to like share a brain. Mm. And like, I found even when we were like walking together or like walking upstairs we'd like time it. We're like he's the, he's the kick and I'm the snare. Like it just... It was it was ridiculous, but yeah. it, it was it was an amazing challenge, and we I just kind of like. I think it was a really good idea that you guys got married because you really are. <laughs> it is it is connected well. It is connected well. Now, yeah. Also, also live that I always dug, and this goes back to Tom Waits again, is singing through the analog telephones. Hello, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd have these guys would have telephones hanging from the coiled wires on the microphones and they would yeah. sing through them and it was freaking <laughs> cool it was the coolest thing i mean tom he uses a, a, a like a, a megaphone horn, megaphone yeah. Yeah. and uh, i've seen you know like feist leslie feist i've seen feist do stuff she just has a second microphone that's treated a certain way there's various ways of going about it i mean with the phones we really limit ourselves to that's the sound because it cuts it's, all the high end off and all the low end off and you can do nothing with it but the sound it makes. It sounds like a telephone. That's all it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, again, we have this thing where we like to we like to tie one arm behind our backs and see how, see if we can still <laughs> swim. And there's something about that that, that you know, I've always loved, the, the bands I've always loved the most are somehow defined by their limitations. Like, I love the Beatles. And the Beatles were amazing singers and amazing songwriters, but they weren't amazing players. They weren't virtuoso players. And the fact that they weren't virtuoso players, they didn't have the opportunity to ruin their own music with virtuosity. They could just, just get by. I mean, obviously in the later records, of course, Paul got really fancy and they used the strings and they, they got amazing, it's amazing, amazing. I love the Beatles. But in the early days, they were just like almost like a punk band. They just got by with what they had and it was fairly limited. They happened to be great singers. So I, I always admire music when you can tell that it's that the limitations are a part of the sound. And I mean, a lot of music is missing that these days yes. because of technology. And, you know, technology is used in a beautiful, artful, exciting way as well. But I think it, it, it also can really 
Sorry. What is your dog scratching on something? Oh my god, you have no idea. It's actually it's we, have like... we have a pig. We have a pig. Guys, guys, now I'll t I'm gonna show you how <laughs> wonderful my dog is. If you look down, Izzy Gray, Izzy Gray down here. Is I that see your dog? Izzy Gray. That's my dog. Oh, Izzy, Izzy looks great. So yeah, our, cute. you know, our dog Mitsu is uh looks like about Izzy's vintage. How old is Izzy? Izzy's about I think she's about ten. Yeah, yeah. Mitsu's ten. Yeah. But Mitsu's Spent a lot of her life on the mean streets of Hamilton, Ontario, and oh. Melissa Melissa runs an animal sanctuary group. I, I was going to ask her about that. Yeah, yeah. And so, she rescued Mitsu, so Mitsu's living yeah. her best life right now, and so she's really taken advantage of her opportunity to take care of. To be, oh, to be to, there to she be noisy is. And... <laughs> she also got a haircut today, so I think oh she's like, God. I think she's a little stressed. Slash, yes. slash excited like she feels good but it was also like a little nerve-wracking for her she's got emojis. So she's, uh, she's just like a little restless tonight well yep yeah, nice. izzy is izzy is a rescue also but tell it tell us a, why don't you i mean we'll ver we'll veer off on this but i mean why don't yeah. you tell us about uh, working with the rescue yeah absolutely so uh ladybird animal sanctuary started with <laughs> that yeah, was pretty like, wasn't it flapped. um <laughs> Uh, myself and two really good friends of mine, um, Janine Stoll and Lisa Wynn, and they're both fantastic musicians, beautiful singers, beautiful songwriters. And I met them when I was a teenager. Like we 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 go way 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 back. Um, the first tour that I ever went on was with those girls. We did an in the round tour, actually out to Nova Scotia, and played different parts of the East Coast, and, and then came home. And then and then we uh, did a live recording and put out a record together. Um, but then we all kind of like went our separate ways musically, um, and we just remained friends. And we were talking about our our passion for animal welfare and. Um, Lisa had worked in and out of the, the animal shelters for years, so she knew a lot about that world. And uh, she had a cat that she wanted to rescue who was having some health issues and, and didn't have anywhere to go. And um, so we just decided let's, let's kind of take on different roles and make this happen. And Janine created a website and we got the word out and uh, someone adopted Oliver the cat and then it just kind of snowballed and we became a registered charity that was over... 10 years ago wow. and uh we've rescued like well over a thousand animals just just on a volunteer basis Man. and it's it's been an amazing adventure it's like this other part of my life and uh yeah. we're, we're working towards buying a farm and mm. opening a sanctuary and so that's kind of like what we're what yeah. we're focused on right now totally fulfilling side venture there yeah <laughs> yeah helping absolutely. out these poor little animals that are being yeah. denied you know oh that's yeah. that is that is fantastic yeah. really amazing stuff well thank you i tell you you guys are willing to hang around till about Little after eight or something like that. Yeah, we gotta yeah. Put, we gotta put Jimmy to bed before long, but we're okay. No let's, stress. Yeah. Let's let's play um, one of your new ones, and because okay. this is this is pretty cool. I like mm -hmm. this. Sometimes Amy. This is a, this is brand new. Brand new. Just released a video for it last week. Yeah, check out the video. Wait wait a minute. Let me let me ask you about your videos, man. You guys got. <laughs> Okay, number one, guys, check out all of their videos because they do crazy. But you guys got some pretty high production value stuff happening there. Just some like really creative people that we're working with, to be honest. Um, the Sometimes Amy video was we were shoot, we were record. So there's this radio conference in, in Boulder, Colorado that we did a few years ago. And because of COVID, we can't do it this year. So what they requested is that we send a recording. So we're like, we got the band together and we learned some songs and we learned new songs. And we rehearsed them a lot. And then we went into a nice place, like a cool looking space, with pro audio situation and a sound person. And we recorded as well as we could. And when uh, we did three or four passes of each song and then we sent this live, it was live actually, this live four song recording. And this is a thing we did in a day. Uh, but during that day, we also thought, well, maybe we can shoot an actual rock video in that day as well. So in three hours, we just, it happened to be a cool enough looking space 
that we just sort of improvised and we just like goofed around and made asses of ourselves and they filmed it and then they edited it and it's now it's video. <laughs> so it took us three hours and it was completely improvised. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It's make. actually really, I, I mean, I think it's a fun video. I, I don't love videos. Videos are hard for me. Yeah. I don't know. Like, don't ask me that. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I can play songs and we can talk about music. I don't know about TV. Leave me alone. But <laughs> you're not a director, man. <laughs> I, no, I'm certainly not. <laughs> Let's listen to this song. This song is really cool, guys. Okay, hold on. KMEC Radio, we're talking to Luke Dusay and Melissa McClellan of Whitehorse. Brand spanking new Whitehorse right there on KMEC Radio. Glad you're all here. It's good to see you all. Oh, Izzy, Izzy liked that song. Look at it. You woke her up. That's fantastic. Ah, she just yawned and went back. Tell me about... That oh by the way that now is that uh that that song is um uh uh, uh where am I again I'm bl- I'm oh uh, sometimes Amy uh, are you actually is that on album is that album out is, that's yes not out. it's it's coming it's out coming out September 10th it's called the album is called Strike Me Down very cool. so we have we have three songs released from that album so far and then the whole record comes out September it, 10th it sounds freaking great man thank you thank you thank you Tell- it's it's a pop song or a rock and roll song like I I think about like you know the, the posies or weezer or, oh yeah i don't know like pop, you know pop pop music in my definition of pop music really i'm a i'm a i'm a monster posies yeah. fan i've had uh mr ken stringfellow on the show before it's ah. fantastic now tell me about 2015 winning the canadian grammy the juno <laughs> best album of the year from for your album leave my leave leave no bridges unburned leave what was that down. What was that year like for you there? Is that pretty crazy? Fun. I mean, yeah. I mean, it is Canada. You got to remember that Canada has the population of Texas or California <laughs> or Florida. I've never, I've never thought of that. I've always thought it's so gigantic. It's got to have as many people as America. No, there's, 30, there's no one here. 30, 36 million people in the country. Um, it was pretty exciting. Though. It was super exciting. Yeah, it was very exciting. Yeah, it was. You know, we'd, we'd worked really, really hard up to that point. You and, know, so yeah, and then around that same point, you play. Do you play Massey Hall around that same time? We did. I think yeah. so. And yeah, that now, for people that don't know, Massey Hall is the like shrine, music shrine of Canada. It's like the, it's like uh, they Grand call it Old like Opera. the Carne- or yeah, or they call oh. it like the Carnegie Hall of Canada. Yeah, it's uh, it's very iconic, beautiful, historic, um, and and just a very uh, inspiring room to play. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was that was a huge milestone for us. You know, I grew up seeing concerts there. So what a year! What a year that must have been. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it made yeah. us feel like oh, this. It was weird because <clears throat> when we started the band, we had this big meeting, and Shauna, our manager from Six Shooter Records, uh, she set up this meeting, and it was us and our booking agent and the the booker, sort of marketing director from Massey Hall, and then the top brass at the CBC at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And it was this meeting to talk about rolling out this band and putting out this record. And I was like, I don't understand why we're meeting with it. Like, I just didn't quite get it. I didn't get it. Like, like, and, and anyway, that what happened is they, there was this talk, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to put the record out and we're going to sell out this venue. And it was like a, 500 capacity venue inside this the annals of the CBC and it's called the Glen Gould Theater beautiful theater but very small uh, and we're like cool we'll sell that out then we're going to move into the Winter Garden which is on Young Street and it's uh, that's that's a 1600 capacity venue which is like four times the size of anything that either one of us had ever sold out on our own even as solo artists so it was like Whew, that's ambitious okay cool and then we're going to then we're going to sell out Massey Hall and this is the thing we talked about in this meeting and I was like you guys are kidding. You guys are fucking with us. This isn't real. This is just like bureaucrats trying to justify their salaries. This isn't real. You know, they, they, there's so many unknowns and variables that go into a, a music career. You can't plan this stuff. I mean, unless maybe if you're Kanye, if you have a lot of money, if you've got millions of dollars, you can plan a certain amount. Like, we're going to put out this record. We're going to sink millions of dollars behind it, and it's going to have a huge single, and then we're going to play Madison Square Garden. And, like, maybe within a certain reasonable set of parameters, you can predict those things, kind of. But not us. That was, my life had never gone like that. People had promised me the moon, promised us the moon before, and you end up with a little piece of rock. And it's like, well, it's not exactly the moon, but cool. And you put that in your pocket and you go up about your life. But the plans they laid out, they kind of happened. Like, 
we went and did that, put the record out. And the CBC was there because they were like, we like your music and we think we're going to play it and we think we can help out. And, you know, it, it's, I, mean, I feel like it's hard to explain to Americans because there's this thing like in Canada, like there's this funding. And the government funds. Well, we got a lot of Canadians here. I was gonna, I was gonna ask right. about yeah, that too. Yeah, a lot of Canadians. Yeah, I just think it's 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 hard to it's a hard concept to grasp because like the government funds the CBC and the government funds record companies and albums and creates this this cultural content. And the reason it's doing that is because at living next door to America, which is this behemoth, this massive cultural juggernaut, it's like if we don't do things to reinforce our own culture, we're just going to get swallowed up. So there was this agreement back when, when you know, free trade agreement that we were going to maintain Canadian identity through culture and invest in the arts. So, you know, these, this meeting with the people at CBC, who, this, rec this, this, this massive uh, uh, broadcasting corporation who's saying, okay, we're going to play your records and then we know it's going to do this for you. And then, and then it all just happened. It just seemed in, totally implausible. So we ended up selling out Massey Hall and be like, this is crazy. It doesn't go like this. And it did. Well, and also that, that was the year that we had our, our child, Jimmy. Yeah, what born. a year. And that, oh, my you know, God. You know, we, we put out that record and we were t touring full time with him as an infant, uh, you know, in the tour van with us. Uh -huh. And so, you know, like we, ha we, we couldn't predict that, that it was going to be a really good, good year and good. Uh, professionally you know we, we thought that it would slow things down that you know things would change dramatically but in fact we were working more than ever and uh and a lot of like great accolades and um yeah playing massey hall was, was a, pretty spectacular what a time. <laughs> and your other daughter was touring with you taking care of your infant yeah yes she was yeah, chloe. chloe chloe who's now 25 years old was on the road just looking after jimmy i mean that 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 will be that year will be something you look back at no matter oh. where you go for the rest of your life. That oh that sounds God. like an incredible so, year. It was such a special year. Wow, so special. I didn't sleep much, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> that feels like a dream. You you talk about this this situation with Canada helping artists, and and then maybe relay that and connect it with your opinions on why is it that it's so hard for Canadian artists to cross that border? Tragically mm. hip, mm. as big as REM in Canada, fill arenas, they come here and they play the Fillmore. Right, that's yeah. a really good question. And it's, and I don't, I mean, I, I have lots of opinions and I, I don't know if some of them are gonna be reasonable and some of them probably aren't. Um, uh, I think that so yes, can, Canadian content regulations stipulate that that Canadian radio stations have to play 35% of their content has to be domestically produced. Wow. So uh, what that means is that it's being pushed. Th and there's a mark therefore there's a market to produce it. And 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 Factor, the foundation to assist Canadian talent on records, invests in record companies and studios and artists, independent artists. You know, there's a whole independent like the, the system of funding to build this stuff up. that's enough to breed good music right there you would think i mean that, you know, there's lots of examples of artists that we all know and love from the last couple decades like i mentioned feist earlier <clears throat> you know i know that her early career was funded by factor you know she becomes a gigantic star sarah mclaughlin you know she had some of her earlier records funded by factor and she mm -hmm. went on to become a big star <clears throat> so it's been a very successful program i think from a an economic and a political perspective um but to your question why don't these do why don't some of these artists break in the states and i think that you know it's a tough it's a it's there's a complicated answer to that a number of complicated answers one of them might just be well the border is a psychological barrier and um you know there's this there's this two-tiered system and a canadian band is like kind of this weird thing that people don't relate to but there's a lot of examples of canadian artists that have done massively well right? whether we're talking about bieber or Neil Young, or Brian Adams, or Sarah McLaughlin. I could go on all day. Okay, okay. Canadian artists who've done well. So clearly, people do very well. I think really what it boils down to, and this is the controversial part, is that because there's a mandate to provide 35% Canadian content on, on Canadian radio stations, a lot of mediocrity slips through, slips into the mainstream. A lot of mediocre Canadian talent mm -hmm. slips into the mainstream because there's a there's a need, there's a there's an active demand for talent. So sometimes it's really, really good, but sometimes it's just not. Wow. So, but sometimes it's not really good, but it's really popular because it gets such a big push from the CBC, from Factor, from all these, 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 yeah. these bureaucratic administrations. It gets a huge push, and sometimes that huge push is enough to put something into the world where it looks like it's doing really well. And then American programmers are listening going, but it sucks. And so they don't get behind it. Now, 
to, to be clear, I have not, I like the Tragically Hip. Yeah. You mentioned them as an example as of, of a band that did really well in Canada and then didn't tra- didn't I mean, cross over. And Blue Roadie is another example, a great Canadian yeah, band that yeah. didn't or, cross over. Or Sloan. Or Sloan. Who's like one of our favorite bands. Sloan, love Sloan, I right? love Sloan. Yeah. Play Sloan. So there's some unbelievable artists yeah. who, who have never crossed over for reasons that I, I couldn't explain. Um, but it has something to do with this bureaucratic system of promoting talent from a bureaucratic perspective, where we have to promote it because it's Canadian, we need more Canadian talent. Yeah. 75% of which is going to be great, 25% is going to suck, we're going to promote it anyway because we have to fill this quota system. Yeah. So I think God. there's something in that story that that works for some bands, doesn't work for other bands. My mind is my mind's exploding <laughs> right now because I've never thought about how different the music industry is on two mm. sides of this border. Oh, massive. Huge we are difference. North America. We are both, this, we are the same continent. Yeah. And here is one thing and here's another animal completely. Yeah. You know, I when you were saying Tragically Hip, uh, I don't know if you know Blue Rodeo, yeah. but they are a, a huge Canadian band, like yeah. legendary, everybody Fantastic. knows Blue Rodeo. They're really Tons great. of hits. Uh, they play huge venues in Canada and we've toured with them a lot. They're great guys. We've opened for them. We, we've done like, you know, different, different collaborative projects with them. Um, but we toured with them in the States. I think it was, it was a solo Luke Doucette opening for Blue Rodeo and I was playing in your band. Yeah. And, you know, we were playing really small venues, but I remember we were in LA playing Hotel Cafe. That's in San Francisco. Oh no, you're right. No, you're right. In right. LA, and yeah, that's yeah, yeah. it's a small venue. It's like what, probably like not even 200 yeah. capacity, like 150. Venue. Very small room, great room. We play there all the time whenever we go to LA. Um, so we played there with Blue Rodeo, like crazy, right? Blue Rodeo like totally sells crazy. Gigantic and, band. And, and it's and it's one of these venues where they have like different artists on every hour, so it's kind of this like assembly line thing. So you know we. Blue Rodeo went up and like played all their epic songs and it was packed in there just like people squeezed in and you know they played Lost Together which is one of their like iconic songs and we were up there singing with them and everyone in the audience had like the lighters and like singing every word and like yeah like tears and I remember coming off the stage and the, the guy who was going the artist that was going on after he was just like who are you people? Like, he just looked at us. He's like, what? Like, where did you come from? Who are you? We're, like, we're Canadians, eh? <laughs> but like yeah, it really, it really struck me. It's like, like wow, two, what a divide. Yeah, 200 people that were weeping there. Yeah, yeah exactly. All expat oh Canadians. Oh my God. Yeah, so, you know, Mick, I just want to say that's a really good question. And if we had three hours, we could spend three hours talking about nothing else. And I don't know that we get to the bottom of it, but it's a really interesting question. And it, it goes to the root yeah. of, of different political philosophies, like do you fund the arts or don't you? And if you fund the arts, does it produce lots of good things? It certainly does. Does yeah. it have a downside? It might also have a downside. Yeah. Brian Adams was very controversial when those Canadian content regulations came in. He said, this merely fosters mediocrity. Oh, yeah. And he was very, very controversially said that. And I... I there are certain perspectives that I'm like, I see what he's saying. Other times mm-hmm. I'm like, no, Brian. Yeah, I think there are two two sides yeah, of it for it's, sure. It's, it's hard yeah. to say because there was like the whole payola thing with with radio and uh, yeah. you know the big the big you know whoever has the money and the power and that that's usually in it's America. Always, it's so it's going to come down to yeah yeah yeah. It's it is it's that is weird. That I'm glad I've, I'm glad we brought that up because that is really intriguing to me and it always has been. It's always boggled my mind that we have these two different, completely different music industries. Yeah. I mean, yeah. really what it boils down to is if, if, if this, I mean, again, I, to put it into perspective, if the state of California was its own economic ecosystem and it happened to live beside a country with 350 million people, it, some, you know, I, it's, it's kind of like you either assimilate completely or you try not to. And, and at some point, in, in the infancy of this country, it was decided that there were going to have to be some some measures taken to try and preserve some semblance of whatever would pass for culture in Canada. Yeah. So that's that's the effort that's being well, made. Well, now so, in, in America, we have to wait for that to be brought back because our last administration just slashed the arts completely. Right. They didn't give a shit about it. And right. so now I guess now that yeah. they now that we've changed again. We'll see. Fingers we'll see if it comes back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. Oh, my God. Um, Influences. Tell us about your early influences. Tell us about what you loved as a kid, both of you. Ooh, that's that's always such a hard one for me because you know I I, I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto. I was born in Chicago, 
Yeah. But, but grew up in the in the suburbs of Toronto and. Uh, you know, my parents listened to all kinds of things. My mom listened to a lot of jazz and classical. Um, so that was like very familiar to me. It's big. That's um, big. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, I hear little things in my music that, that came from that, even though I never really studied that. Um, you know, they listened to a lot of Gordon Lightfoot, Neil Young, oh, yeah. uh, Mark Knopfler. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of that. And then, you know, I discovered Top 40 Radio when I was seven or eight, and it just, like, blew my mind. I'm like, what? You can just turn on this thing? And it's like, oh, this popular music. Like, I, I just was obsessed with it. I was obsessed with the radio. Yep. Um, and then my older sister was listening to a lot of hip-hop. And, you know, and then my friends in high school were listening to hip-hop. And there was just, and then, you know, there was the the kind of, like, underground punk rock scene that I got into with my my first boyfriend and you know there were a lot of like great uh like indie Canadian kind of like in indie punk rock bands um that I got into and then like a lot of singer songwriters so I think like you know diversity all over the map and I think that's yeah. very um common now you know in the in the last few generations it's yeah. it's just like we're not we're not bound to our location to determine what kind of music we're going to be into. Cause it's I hope just like, I hope you're right there. Cause I tend to think yeah. kind of the opposite sometime where I think now that we've taken, there is no, there is no radio. Like when I was a kid where you'd have Johnny cash next to the strawberry alarm clock, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. You have it all broken mm. into. So, so I, the way I look at it is somebody growing up gets into a station, gets into a style and they don't That's go anywhere. True. Now you had a diverse upbringing in music, everything from jazz to classical to hip hop. So you, that, that, that opened your mind. How Absolutely. About, and I, yeah. I feel like a lot of true music lovers really absorb music that yeah. way. Yep. Yep. Um, even if they, they don't at first, they kind of come, come to it, you know, mm -hmm. they, they can recognize mm -hmm. greatness in, in every genre. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Luke? What did you listen to when you were a kid? I'm trying to think like, so, I went through a like the Beatle, Beatle, huge Beatles phase as a oh, kid. It was yeah. very personal to me, and me I just too. like I, I, I still to this day, like when somebody tells me they love the White Album, I'm like you like it too, because I and then I realized it was the biggest record that was ever put out in this in 1969, and like I still think it, I'm the only one who loves that record. I just like it. I, it makes me want to cry. Um, and I did this interesting thing recently where I went through it just impulse intuitively. I didn't think much about it. I was like, you know what? I want to hear this, but I don't want to hear all these 28 songs. I'm just gonna get rid of some songs. And I crossed out a whole bunch of songs and I made a playlist of, and I called it the White Album Abridged. And what it turns out I did without realizing it is I got rid of almost all of Paul's songs. Um, and I like Paul. I think what Paul did on the backside of, of, um, of Abbey Road, I think Paul's a genius. Paul's a genius. But on, on the White Album, he was just, he just kind of, his songs were kind of shitty and I just didn't buy it. But John's songs and, and, and George's, fantastic. Yeah. So, well, um, I, the White Album to me was that way too. I remember as a kid, my yeah. cousin, my older, maybe six year old, six year older than me, cousin coming down from Sa Sacramento at Christmas and bringing it. And this is the White Album. And he puts oh the God. record on and I'm six years younger. I'm like, right. I'm uh, third grade. And I don't even know what the hell it is. I mean, there, that, another, that talk about diversity. It's oh one of the God. most diverse records ever. You know, it's got country, it's got folk, it's got, it's got blues, everything. It's got heavy metal. They invented heavy metal with Helter made, Skelter. They invented it, heavy metal on a record that also had like Julia and I Will. Exactly, it's ridiculous. It, it blew my third, third year, third grade mind. You know, and so then I didn't have any money and I couldn't buy it. And I couldn't. Yeah. And I was like, I need, I need to find some way to buy this record. And I didn't get the record until this, I'm going to show my age now. I don't get the record until my brother gives it to me on eight track about five years later. So I get it on eight track, double eight track, <laughs> two eight tracks. You know? uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, so uh, I was huge into the Beatles, and then you know I went through it in my teenage years. I was trying to find things that were more personal. I found the Stones and the Who, and I found the Kinks, and I found a bunch of stuff you know, fairly predictable British invasion, blues-based rock and roll. Yeah. But then, um, so my parents, my, my parents only had about 20 records in these two milk crates in the house. And it was Willie Nelson's Stardust. It was, um, it was Paul Simon's oh, Fif Still Crazy After All These Years, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, that record. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was some Ray Charles. Uh, I don't remember which record, but classic Ray Charles, a couple yeah. of Ray Charles records. 
Um, it was, uh, there was a lot of Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughn, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Randy Newman and J.J. Kale were really important. Jeez. Tom Waits. Was, Tom Sonny Waits. Rollins, McGee. What's that? Sonny, Sonny Terry and Brandon McGee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sonny Terry and Brandon McGee. Um, Tom, Tom Waits was huge. Uh, Your parents turned you on to Tom Waits? Oh, yeah. Well, well, uh, the Heart of Saturday Night came out in 73 or 74. So the first the first bunch of records on the island records were Closing Time, Small Change, The Heart of Saturday Night, and Blue Valentine. And those records came out like 71, 2, 3, 4, yeah. 5, whatever, in that period. I was born in 73. So I had that music piped into my face from the time Jeez. I was a kid. So they were big fans of that. They were huge. And so so it was jazz and it was American songbook stuff. And it was, you know, so that was really what 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 influenced me like when i decided after after the veal days when i want this punk rock band i had out of vancouver when i wanted to go back and make music that i could that i could calm down like everybody calm down we don't have to scream all the time it doesn't have to be so fucking loud we can relax i i really that it was i went back into tom waits and randy newman and jj kale and Emmylou harris and and you know billy holiday and 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 that those records that that my parents listened to and uh and i tried to find things to mine in that world. So that was that was sort of where it came, you know, J.J. Wow. Kale's Naturally, Randy Newman's Sail Away. Those records were massive in my house. Both of you, both of you were, were lucky to have situations where you were brought up with this diversity and oh, it expanded so. your mind, mm -hmm. man. Yeah, mm -hmm. like Stevie Wonder's Inner Vision. Oh. The time I was, you know, three or two years old, just like every day I heard that record, every day. Like you oh. go from Ricky Lee Jones to Stevie Wonder, to Emmy Lou, to Tom Waits, to Randy Newman. That was just every day. It was great. That is, that is crazy, man. It was really lucky, and, yeah. And Luke, Luke, Luke just mentioned Veal, that his early punk rock band. Yeah. Quote unquote punk rock, kind yeah, of, yeah. you know. But I don't know. you were you were hard. Let's just say that. Uh, I did play. If you if you were here at the beginning of the show, I played. I hate your lipstick. I heard it. So good. So good. That was well, me, that I was, love Veal. That love was me Veal. being as tough as I could possibly be, all 136 pounds of me. <laughs> I want to. I want to play Judy Carlin though, because I almost played it earlier. Oh, but... it's such a good one. Thank here you. you. Here you go. This is Veal, you guys. I love Veal, but not the meat. I do not like to eat. I do not like to eat small baby cows at all. I'm not into it. Come on back in for a okay, minute. There we go. There you are. Don't you, to eat babies. I don't I, eat babies. <laughs> but the band, I love the band. I love those records, man. Yeah, now, now I know you guys got to leave, but I got to okay. bring. I got to bring in our resident Nova Scotian. Is that what? what you, is that is that what you call somebody from Nova Scotia? A Nova Scotian? Yeah. Okay. Or a blue noser? Or a blue noser? <laughs> wait, wait. Let me bring him in. Come on in, Will. Will, Will Hansen, Luke Doucet, yeah. Melissa McClellan, I wanted to introduce you guys. Um, Will won a, I'm, I guess I should let him tell you this story, but he won a uh, talent contest that you, Luke, uh, so, I'll explain. So it was yeah. the Sleepwalk Festival, probably oh. 2012, I think. I was still in high school then. I had a telly with a bender on it and uh, I couldn't actually get to Toronto for the actual festival because I was in high school and I couldn't go. But My that's God. where I first heard about you guys and Shauna and all that through uh, entering this this random contest that I was in. And I'm, I'm actually from Nova Scotia, from Halifax. I'm still here. And uh, yeah, that's when Nick amazing. was like, oh, yeah. The, and I'm normally it's like we stay up late and I'm the resident Canadian that tunes into this the k thing. So nice. he's like, yeah, we're having fellow Canadians on the show. I just wanted to pop in and say hi. Uh, oh, that's awesome. That's so great. I love that. That's so yeah, great. So that was, yeah, this, close to 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I had I much shorter hair. and uh, this, guy will, <laughs> this guy will be here on the show at 3 o'clock in the morning his time. And, we'll, and I'll be going, what? Why didn't you go to sleep, man? We're all night owls. We're all night owls. It's a Canadian. It must be a Canadian thing. That's so. cool. But yeah, I so, wanted to connect you guys. So yeah. Will, yeah, um, you live in Halifax still? Yeah, I'm still. I'm in Halifax. I actually just moved to downtown. I was out in Spryfield forever oh, okay. at my yeah. parents' place, and I've just oh. kind of moved into town. Had to pare down my guitar collection to move to a smaller place, which was always difficult, but. Um, yeah. yeah, just kind of moved into the city and I play in a bunch of bands. I've played on people's records and kind of do my own thing. I have a YouTube channel and uh, just have fun. I play a lot That's of, so cool. I'm into a lot of old, old, great old rock and roll and old blues music, you know, like a big Mississippi Fred McDowell fan and a lot of okay. that old country stuff. Can, can we just, just not, because I got to go, but I do want to, I want to pick your brain for one second. Uh, yeah. Garrett, Garrett Mason. 
Huge fan. I tried to go see him yesterday and it was full uh, oh, good. at Beerly's. Yeah, I, I was going to take my, I just picked up an old Harmony Stratotone, a 50s one. I was going to take it down and show it to him, but uh, I couldn't even get in the door. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry you couldn't get in, but I'm happy that people are going to his gigs. <laughs> yeah. No, Garrett's a friend of mine. He's uh, fantastic. I've stolen he, a lot of licks from him over the years. He's just one of those guitar players that I, I, I've i watched. I've gone down some YouTube rabbit holes, and I'm just like, I, I don't know where this guy comes from. This is insanely it's, wonderful. It's unbelievable. It's, yeah, I, I'm i with you on that one. I've seen him play, you know, a hundred times, and I still don't know where he's coming from either. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. He's really special. I want to yeah. I want to hook you guys up. I'll send emails to one sure, of you or another. Yeah. Because, I think yeah, I have yeah. you on Facebook, Luke, at some cool, point. Man. From yeah, reach out. You know. yeah, let me awesome. let I'll me send you a message. Cool. Will is fabulous. He's a fabulous guitar player. He's playing with some great people. Everything I've heard him record is just brilliant. So I I I like to hook up good That's guys. Great. That's good super guys. exciting. Mm. Thank you. Anyways, thank you, Will. I love you. Hang out if you would like. Please I'll, hang I'll out. I'll be here. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I'm glad we got you guys in, man. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much. Dude, you are the pleasure. best. Yeah, thanks I, for having us. I can't wait when th till when things get back to normal again, whatever normal will be at that point. Um, but when you guys come back, I'm I'm there to see you guys again. Can't wait. Yeah, we'll be at we'll be at the Hotel Cafe or the Hotel Utah. Or yeah, the Hotel, Hotel Utah. Hotel Utah. Hotel Utah. That's Hill. the one. I love that venue. Or the bottom of the okay. hill or the uh, oh, bottom of the hill. What's the one that we played up in Castro up at near the? Uh, is it the is something Paris? Oh, 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 oh. Um, uh, yeah, yeah Cafe Cafe Bard. Cafe du Nord. Oh Dunard. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a it, great that's a good one. spot. Yeah. It's changed a little. That one. Okay. Last time All I right. went there, it changed owners, but I mean, uh, also the right. Connected to it is the uh, Swedish American Hall. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think this this record we're going to put out in in January is going to be such a smash. We're, we'll we'll see you at the Fillmore. <laughs> Maybe it's Candlestick great. Candlestick Park. We'll see you there. <laughs> is that venue still open, Candlestick Park? You heard of that venue? They ripped it down. They ripped we're playing it there anyway. Down. They're going to build it back for us. <laughs> no, this would be great on the ruins of Candlestick Park. White Horse yeah. Pompeii Park. Part Two. <laughs> Guys, I love you, man. Uh, <laughs> send me your email address or your yep. actual mailing address, and sure. I'll send you guys a bunch of comics, too. Amazing. You're, you're the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, guys. We Have love you. Have a good you. night. Woo! Bye. KMIC Radio with White Horse.